Dragon Spring Village in the hills above Chongqing, where Li Xingming's family has worked the fields since the 19th century. Before our village never planted vegetables, only rice. Now we grow vegetables and we grow less rice. We just grow what we need. This growing and changing demand is coming from China's ever-expanding cities, where some 300 million up-and-coming urbanites, like Liu Min's family, expect much more than traditional staples like corn and rice. My family, like others, has more meat, not too much though, and we buy more dairy products as well as vegetables and eggs. But there's also more food inflation, with prices up 17% year on year. And with a more varied and improved diet comes other supply chain stress, as animals need feeding too. It's an unusual pressure. Those kind of products rely on grain for animal feed. And so it changes the equation. You get now a much higher demand for corn and for soya beans to, for animal feed here, which is very different to, to the traditional diet. Since the 1990s, pork consumption has doubled and chicken demand quadrupled. This has resulted in a hunger for imports. Last year, purchases of corn from the US increased 18-fold. And China is by far the world's biggest customer for soya beans. The markets are watching carefully. The import of soybeans is around 50 million tonnes. The global market has already accepted this. So I think it's impossible to have too much price fluctuation. And China imports over a million tonnes of corn, and the global market has already factored this in. But increased demand, notably from China's pig and poultry industries, could well drive prices up. China must also import other crops to supplement domestic harvests. In 2010, rice imports were up over 10% year-on-year at almost 340,000 tonnes, while shipments of wheat rose 36% to over a million tonnes. To feed the population, however, China is almost self-sufficient in most basics for now. It holds over 150 million tonnes in grain reserves, a third of the country's annual grain consumption. But the nation which has to feed a fifth of the world's population on a tenth of its arable land is at a watershed. China is expected to rely more and more on supplies from abroad, as the options for increasing domestic production are limited. Urbanisation through building and pollution has reduced the amount of available arable land to danger levels. And urbanisation has drawn the younger, more able-bodied away from the countryside. In Dragon Spring Village, no one under 50 farms the fields. It poses a question. When the likes of Mr Lee can work no more, who'll grow all the food? China is also prone to other hazards, from floods to landslides to drought. This year has wreaked devastation on some key regions' wheat, corn and rice harvests. And as a consequence, prices have shot up. Urbanisation and natural disasters aside, China's big agri-food players with huge economies of scale are at the forefront of securing the nation's food supplies, investing heavily in boosting yields from seed technology to mechanisation. By promoting the use of technology and standardisation to improve our output and to guarantee produce security, we can provide good, safe, nutritional agricultural produce for all. Food is also now part of China's strategic overseas investment strategy, alongside mining and high-tech. Beta Huang plans to invest over a billion dollars in Argentina to develop corn, soybean and vegetable farms, so help guarantee China's future food supplies. Other Chinese land and food resource investments elsewhere in Asia are under discussion. Uh, I think China's food security depends on our own efforts, and there are some Chinese food companies. But after all, we have over $2 trillion in foreign exchange reserves. Now we're in a situation where we have capital for investing overseas. As China reformed and opened up, it changed the world of manufacturing. Now, a more prosperous China is changing the dynamics and economics of food supplies, 
at home and abroad.